Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and this is my channel 1984. Today I have two really nice heat sinks here from Alpha. They are probably familiar to some of you and uh, the model number on these things are PAL6035. It's just down here and uh, Alpha Co LTD. So I was at a LAN party a few months ago and apparently there was some loot there and I was late so everyone had had their pick apparently. So while well, I went to look at what was left uh, because this was uh, essentially free and in there were these two coolers There were actually also new water cooling and stuff but uh, yeah I felt kind of greedy already in picking these things up no one wanted them I don't know why. But these are really classical coolers and the video isn't really about these two coolers but uh, we're gonna get to what the video is about unless uh, the thumbnail already gave it away. So uh, I'm gonna connect these coolers up to some uh, power because there are delta fans on these things. One of these RPM cables had broken off from the, one of the fans uh, was like that when I got it. Uh, pretty. And it's not accessible to solder on, but uh, yeah. So I got some power here going. I moved the mic up here so you can hear them. So I'm gonna give them 12 volts straight up. So yeah, that is 4800 RPMs, so not the noisiest deltas I've had, but uh, yeah, pretty noisy. So this one over here marked, it actually has some bearing noise. I don't think, I don't think these fans have been used much. They were, the, the dirt on them is the original dirt, it's not much. But this one has uh, bearing noise, this one doesn't really, so there's a wine come from this one. So I think this is a case of premature bearing failure on this one. But uh, let's run some 5 volts just for uh, good measure. So, I think you can hear that one. So a lot of hiss from that one. I should be able to hear it going away now. I do like Deltas, they make really good quality fans and uh, there's a lot of Delta fans in computers where people didn't even realize there are. Uh, Nvidia namely historically has used them for like a couple of decades. But these are definitely the original fans because they are like some QC stickers or something here installed so they've never been removed. But yeah, I'm gonna replace these fans because they're too noisy. But uh, the video isn't about these coolers, but what they actually kind of started. Because uh, what do you want when you have two identical coolers? <laughs> Let's see. So, like I said, uh, what do you want when you have two identical coolers? You want a motherboard with two CPUs. So what happened was that I called a friend and uh, said I got these coolers and uh, yeah, would be nice with a motherboard for that. And I've been looking on eBay and there are motherboards for Pentium 3 on eBay, so that's not an issue. And the price is more of an issue and what kind of board you can get. So he told me I have a board and uh, I said I can't buy that board because it's like, I think I found one of these on eBay for like 375 pounds, which is a lot. So. I said I had that power leap card from my uh, Alpha that I built that I got from him, fully restored uh, with uh, Doom SSD, half gig of RAM, a couple of CPUs for it, uh, tell it in and order a copy of mine. So I said, uh, do you want that in trade? Because I got it from him and was like, yep, I want that in trade. So I traded that for this instead. So this is the Asus Cub 4X DLS, or however it's supposed to be pronounced, I don't know. It's, it's this typing, you know, the 
It's called, uh, if you go by the, just by the letters, uh, CUV4XDLS. Uh, it's a Rev103. So, yeah. So, I got this board. It was supposed to have dual pencil trees, 733s, I think, and two gigs of RAM. I actually had uh, dual 1 gigahertz with uh, 4 gigs of RAM. And uh, he bought this from Victor Bart like five years ago, apparently, he said. So, yeah, and that was kind of funny because it does work. I did test it, but uh, it has a problem getting stuck just at memory detection and uh, counting. And it's uh, apparently there were some hair in one of the memory slots under the actual memory. So once I got that out, it also not only stopped getting stuck half the time, but it actually found another 256 megs of RAM. So I suppose you shouldn't put your beard in uh, the memory slot. So this is a pretty nice board. It doesn't support Talatin out of the box. You can make mod the Talatin for it, but uh, I, I'm not going to do that. I know the previous owner bought CPUs for that and doing that. So we can have a look at one of these memory sticks here. So these are Samsung RAM, the PC133, CAS3. There is actually a CAS2 version of these also called the C7. B or C7C, I think. These are C7A. Uh, I have the PDF for them. So these are the slower ones, but uh, still, this is still one gig of PC133 on a single stick. The way they got that in there is actually these memory chips are actually two on per side stacked. So they look kind of funny. Uh, so you can put them under the microscope and have a look. Uh, but yeah, so the, the, it's because it's ECC and registered, there are nine like modules if you can call modules in a module because there are two ICs here so they're actually 18 per side but uh, they take up nine slots like you would expect ECT to do so there are actually 36 memory chips on here and 144 I think total for the whole system so let's put this under a microscope for the fun of it so there is the model number if you want to look it up uh, Samsung so I think we could actually see how these are designed at an angle here. Yeah, so as you see I'm twisting it and it almost looks like I have a RAM chip floating. I don't know if the top chip and the bottom chip are identical. I suspect that they had different, slightly different pin now so you can address one or the other. So yeah, that is the RAM. So the original plan for this uh, board uh, was to build a system. And that's the plan still. I was uh, Because of the original CPUs like I figured was in it, I was thinking like a 1999 build. Uh, but this board is technically like 2001, I think uh, the documentation I can find is from January 2001. CPUs are from like, I think December 2000, if you go back in the couple one one gigahertz, I think they came out somewhere around there, or maybe November, October, November, something like that. Because the CPUs are faster than I figured they were, uh, I'm thinking uh, like a 2001 build instead of like a 1999 build. It is a bit weird with copper mines in 2001 because of the Talatins com coming out at that time and it's not supporting them under the box. So it's kind of like a, like a very late board. So if uh, we want to talk about specs on this board, this for the, could be nice to know what it is. So it's not Intel based, it's actually VIA based. So you got the VIA VT82C694XDP. Other than that, I think it's 4x ADP. You got your typical 32 megahertz PCI buses. Nothing exciting there. You do have SCSI on it, and it's oh, like I said, uh, it came from Victor Bart apparently. So you know how SCSI. Uh, I don't think there's a board without SCSI at this point. Uh, so there's an LSI chip there, uh, Ultra 160. Uh, might use it. I don't have anything to use for it right now. Uh, so, and it doesn't like my SIL sort of cards, I tested that, it hates it, it's an apparent problem incompatible to motherboard bias, so. I do have uh, adapters for the IDE on the way. So yeah, it supports up to 4 gigs of RAM actually, but it doesn't so support PAE, so physical address extension, the chipset, as far as I can tell, is now. So, you can't really use all the 4 gigs, depending on how many like add-on cards you ha have. So like an ADP card will reserve a lot more than say a PCI. PCI card for the graphics. Uh, if you have, the, um, if you, you can jumper disable the SCAS with the jumpers, you can do that with the network. If you disable them with the jumpers, instead of in BIOS, you will actually also free up RAM that you can use for programs. So 
you have four geese physical support it seems but the actual is more like 3.7 to 3.9 depending if you count um, how you count but it's more like 2.7 to 3.8 in the OS uh, that I can get out of it and when I tested it a bit so it's the end results gonna depend on number of PCI cards things like that and how much like addict space they reserve but I mean in 3.75 gigs on a couple of pension trees is insane for any kind of mere mortal use so yeah that is pretty much motherboard uh, it does support overclocking as some people I saw someone on Vogan's running dual modded Talatins with good stepping set, like 166 plus in memory. So it does seem to be fairly good overclocker if that's of interest. I have no plans on that right now though. This board actually has some really nice quality caps, which is rare I think. So the caps around here are actually Nishikons. Uh, and uh, they are quite good, they look really nice, but that doesn't mean anything really. The board actually looks really nice overall, but they actually, like I said, it was quite dirty in the memory slots, so I had a lot of issues there. So I actually cleaned them, or the cleaned the board a bit, just to make it work. So it's gonna have a full clean. But yeah, we got some nice Nishikon caps all over. So I was kind of like debating for myself, should I recap it or not, because... Good caps from a good brand that looks good doesn't mean they're necessarily good. I don't think there's anything wrong with these. I would probably, if I just wanted a system that worked, probably run these caps for another five years. But they are like 22 years old. So, um, went on to Mauser and I got some uh, different new caps. So, for the big ones that are over here, over here, over here. I got some Panasonic instead. It's not that I don't like niche guns, but these Panasonic are marketed at low ESR. And I do have specs for these, and I actually looked these up on here. I have specs for both. So a cheat sheet note here would uh, tell me that these niche cons here, if uh, all caps have some resistance. Uh, so uh, in a perfect world, if you just draw on paper in, uh, like a circuit and want to design something, you might just assume the cap has no resistance, and but it does have resistance, which also means losses. So, what they, when people talk about ESR or impedance, that's usually what they refer to. And I'm no expert on that, but um, I did look these up and I bought some new ones, the pretty much the best I could get. So, these old niche accounts are rated at uh, 23 milli ohms, and that is at a 20 centigrade room temperature or well, well room temperature but if they are 20 C so room temperature for us uh, and at 100 kilohertz uh, frequency so that basically charging this charge so that could be a VRM running say at 100 kilohertz would be then the, the, that impedance would apply so uh, at the 100 kilohertz and 20 C which is fairly normal uh, Point where they give you the spec of 23, in this case 23 milli ohms of resistance. So I bought uh, some new uh, mouse here, a lot of caps, not, not all for the motherboard, but I have some. Uh, but I bought, um, in this case for these, I bought uh, Panasonic uh, Low ESR FR series, I think these are. So they are spec'd uh, also at 100 kHz and 20C which is good, then we can compare quite easily, and I expected 18 milli ohms. There were four different uh, like bins at this, uh, from this series of caps, and these were the lowest ones. I actually think there were some 23 milli ohms ones too. The highest were 43 milli ohms. But like I said, these are 18, so they're a little bit lower than the original, uh, which well, I assume should be good. That's usually the, the train of thought, but you don't want to go too low. So I'm don't, I don't do poly mods because then we're going to end up in the 3 to 10 milli ohm range. And that could actually could be a problem with the VRM, not liking that. It, it kind of everything is designed to go together. Also, these are five millimeter taller. I could get uh, basically similar spec uh, Panasonic low ESR, but I decided to go with these ones. Then. Basically, I think these cost one euro thirteen uh, currently, or about thirteen Swedish kroners plus tax, which is twenty five percent. So yeah, they were not cheap. And there are some other caps too on this board. You might have seen the yellow ones down here. There's some yellow ones down here. So I got basically identical spec ones, maybe even better. 
from Nishikons. So even if we recap it, some Nishikons are going back on. And these had also really low uh, ESR and uh, good specs. So also quite expensive. They were, were even better than the equivalent Panasonic low ESR. So yeah, and I have more cap for the whole board. But the, those are the, like the, I would say the interesting caps on this. A lot of the other ones aren't really involved in like the switching of the uh, like CPU voltage and stuff. So yeah, if I'm gonna recap it, I figured I, I, I really want some good caps. It ended up being very expensive total. There aren't that many caps on the board, really, being dual socket. I have done more caps on single socket boards. But I really hate these coolers. It's a hole there. It's the only like place to put the screwdriver. So I usually go in this way if I'm gonna push it in place. Get it off, I do the same way in here, and then I put the screwdriver behind, and, like bend the clip out when it's down, so it cuts off. So we do have the alpha coolers, so that will solve that because they have proper mounting clips that can be easily removed if we need to. I suppose the only thing left to do is really strip it of everything that is removed, we can remove and then recap it. And then you can argue in the comment if it was pointless recapping it or not, but uh, I'm planning, on paper at least, uh, planning. Uh, pretty much like a fully serviced and um, like no system out of it so not doing the board is then kind of then everything else is like new or recapped uh, some i actually got some new old new old stock parts for this system once i built it so yeah let's get to recapping and um, less talking we have the board on the board heater uh, it's a pretty big board but i'm gonna do my best to film it uh, I can check the temperature here, about 85.9. It's gonna be colder at the edges here. Uh, 54, and this is centigrades. I set my iron to 320 centigrades. I have a tip that is 4.6, so almost uh, five uh, millimeters. That's so you can get in between the legs of the caps. That really helps. I heat them both at the same time and Instead of trying to get one uh, leg at a time, you take both at once. So we can try that here. So as you heard, it just fell out. And that's the advantage of uh, having a board heater. You see, it also makes even more of a difference when you want to uh, when you want to uh, clean the holes. And yeah, try to clean your iron between uh, between every time you solder or desolder. Always easier to desolder things if you add new uh, solder to it to really make a good. Uh, if it's oxidized, it will lower the temperature. Also, if it's uh, lead free, which this isn't, it would also help. Uh, so, yeah, adding new solder tends to help a lot in getting the old one to melt. This big tip just helps uh, putting more heat into the board in the working area. That's why I'm using a board heater and a bigger tip. See how it gets fun or not. 
you have a lot of uh, like a big copper plane here and uh, a lot of wires connecting it to the other side or some internal layer now so this is gonna suck a lot of heat that's where the board heater is worth gold a lot of bias here and those dots connects another couple plane got the hole here so my plan is to connect my iron with as many of them as i can or i do some flux too just to make sure everything stays nice and not oxidized that way i can put heat in through the board and get the hole clean hopefully I actually check the thing with the cap It's just about enough. No real force required, so that's good. I find those places almost impossible without the board heater. So we have one more of these places with a lot of copper planes and uh, vias here. I'm starting on the left here, so I don't... If I start from the right, I'm probably just gonna clog my hole up again. Start from... Work from this way to that way, from left to right. Let's see here we can get this one. Hmm, not nicer than I figured. Let's put some tin back on these uh, wires. It actually seems to have holes. One got cleaned out, but yeah, that should do it. Put some tin back in those. I tend to uh, get removed some of the tin when you do the, the actual hole for the capacitor. Some flux actually helps with uh, uh, the solder not sticking to random places on the PCB. You can uh, you can remove it. It's just not stuck like soldered stuck. Just gets a bit sticky to the board. So some people say you don't need flux to remove stuff, and that's often true. But it, at least this anti flux I use uh, also leaves less uh, like solder on the soldering mask so there are advantages to doing that if it tends to get stuck so getting these holes clean should be fairly easy Make some cleaning here, makes the board nice to handle. Mostly burnt flux from this, I think, from the core of the solder.
The board is uh, decapped. So next step would be to add some caps. And the hot plate is still hot, but off. That's uh, how the board looks now. I don't think there's any caps left. I haven't seen any. So yeah, let's uh, start putting in new caps. We are uh, ready to put in some caps here. And I'm gonna put up the image for the caps uh, on the screen here if you have this board or if you ever get it and they want to recap it. And uh, we do have the images for this board and other motherboards on our Discord server if you want to have the cap list and where they go. They should be mostly correct. Uh, but yeah, you should always verify, obviously. And there can also, also be differences between the same boards. I've seen the same board have different caps, so it doesn't mean then you can't use the, uh, the ones on my list, but it just means that they use different ones. Time to put in some caps then, and I think we start with the big ones, because they're top on, on top of my list. Sometimes it's easy to start with small ones when you ground the board so you don't bend the new ones. And on this board, if we look at looked at the cap image, uh, uh, the white stripe on the cap, which is negative, goes to the transparent half of the circle, so the, the opposite white one uh, half circle is positive on this motherboard, and the transparent one is uh, negative. So we have to the negative stripe has to go to the Transparent one. This differs from board to board. There's no real rule there, it seems. Just gonna use some, uh, it's like, I don't know what the English name is, but uh, just like sticky stuff you use for putting like a piece of paper on the fridge or something. Hold the cap. I like to add some flux to the 
big copper planes here because of the time it takes to heat them up properly. Get a good solder joint. Uh, and the next one to it, I probably could play on the other side, but uh, on this side it really isn't an issue. Get heat into it. So I don't uh, really need a lot of flux there, many flux. But the big ones I like to use it because uh, the time you have to stay with iron. So we don't have any board heater right now. So that's the big caps done. So I'm gonna continue and it seems like we need the two over here. So the new one are Nishikons and uh, they're brown, so not no flashy yellow, sadly. So not a fine color, but that's not that important. Otherwise, same spec as the other ones. Uh, I don't know about the ESR and stuff and other ones, I don't know what they were. It seems they were a bit weirdos. So now that those are done, the next one to it actually the next type on the list to do is so 1000 uh, microfarad, 6.3 volts. I don't remember what the voltage mine were the new ones, we can check. So the new ones I got uh, are 10 volts, which is fine, so much better, more useful. So let's start with the 1000 microfarad here in the corner here. I think it's is for the USB ports. Clean that hole slightly badly.
the taint that's all the green and the uh, the 1000 microfarad I marked as green caps on my, my cap list we need six 100 microfarads now so as before these are uh, low ESR uh, Panasonic FR caps so six of them we need Mostly around the memory scas it seems Oh, by the way, I kind of forgot, but I actually do have one going in here. Uh, we got another 680, but it's uh, for the 12 volt rail for this AG AGP Pro. Oh, let's see, I'm gonna have some 22s and uh, one is going over here. So these are 10 microfarad and 25 volts. They are not FR. I think you can get FR, but they don't have like really small or low voltage sizes. 
and like I think it started 50 volts or something so it might be I think they were too big so anyway this is still uh, Panasonic so I'll take a put, start putting them around the CPU here uh, you can complete this area That should be all the caps. Uh, I obviously have to look the board over, make sure they're all there, and uh, also just check for some shorts on the V core and stuff like that. So we don't have any shorts now for some reason. Other than that, uh, I need to clean the board. It was, it was dirty, I had a problem with the memory slots before, so I'm gonna clean the board. Then we can test it. The board is done, got it out of the oven, and uh, yeah. Looks pretty good, I think. Put on the heat sink again. Gonna put in a CMOS battery. And we can put in the CPUs. Yeah, the right way is a good way. So that's one CPU. So like I said, these are one gigahertz copper mines, 1.75 volts. So now before we mount the coolers and RAM, I need to swap some uh, fans on these heat sinks here because of noise level and one of them having a bad bearing. So with the fans I found to slightly thicker but lower RPM Sunons, uh, which is a really nice brand. And you find them in old computers too, so it's perfectly suitable. I was actually, you can actually see here how small the engine hub is on these things. I use uh, one of these, about the 10 millimeter thickness one. In like an ITX uh, router, it's really nice to be able to have these small engines. Uh, it gives more surface area for blade. So I did mention that these uh, fans are thicker. That is somewhat of a problem. Because I have been to four hardware stores trying to find screws. These screws are 50 millimeters, and that's the longest I could find. I could probably order some custom, like there are on the internet, but then I have to wait. And uh, yeah, and there is another solution that a lot of fans already have when you buy like a combination, like a heatsink with fan, and it's countersunk holes in the fan. So I actually did countersink them, and if I remove this shim. Uh, or the washer is called. It's gonna help too. So yeah, that's the plan. That way you can reuse the screws and still have these 15 millimeter tall uh, uh, fans instead of the 10 millimeter ones. Also, you can notice uh, that these fans were in uh, pull configuration. Uh, that's also why I have this shroud here and uh, the notches here allows it to sit about five millimeter above. If the fan blades are too close to heatsink, they will make colorable noise uh, when they're more or less licking the top. Uh, you get a very annoying noise from the turbulence created that way. 
So these heat sinks are designed for pull, not push. You can obviously run whatever you want, but uh, so you can clearly see that this is factory. So yeah, so you can definitely run heat sinks in pull just fine, and these are essentially designed for it. So I'm gonna keep it that way because it works much better in uh, with m multiple processors because the air is gonna hit the side of the panel and find its way out the back of the case where the because the rear fans exhaust fans are uh, closest to the side panel. So this is a lot more efficient in my Atom MP and it's uh, gonna be in this one too, though the Pension 3 don't use as much power. <laughs> Uh, when we actually, when I used these coolers in back in the day, uh, I ran most of the water cooling, but I did build system for friends with uh, with Alpha Pals. Uh, usually, I don't even remember, I think you could buy them with out fan and with different types of fans. But uh, what we did, and what both people wanted, was a silent system. So we used like Salmon's fans instead. So I'm quite, uh, well... Well, I can understand why there is a high performance fan on this because it was an overclocker, competitive overclocker. I used these, so that way I can understand why they have these fans on. But it seems like an odd option for Alpha Pals. Most people seem to prefer the silent fan options for them. I'm just gonna remove the glue residue. So oh, yeah, these are really nice condition. Not much to complain about here. So, yeah, you can really see this stack now. They, they use a hex pattern for the fin stack. It's a little bit unusual. I think it's pretty much an alpha thing. Um, yeah, but so the surface area is pretty good on these for the time. And uh, so yeah, it seems to be designed for laminar flow, which is what we get with pull. So I'm gonna try to put it so I get the cable where it makes the most sense. So let's put this on here. These were very loose from uh, factory, so we don't need to tighten them much. So, that looks nice. So these pu pulls 0.6 watts, the, oh, the deltas were par, uh, 3 watts, so 3 watts and 0 0.6 watts. So, 5 times more power, I guess. I'm at this in my head. This is MX4. Shouldn't it completely be kill for this? So this will work fine. I'm not much, much easier during setup game one now that I know how the clip works. So my plan here was to pull this like so.
so that is the board completed uh, with new caps, uh, CPUs, RAM, coolers, and fans installed. So nothing left to do but test it. So a friend of mine gave me a test bench here, so I can actually <laughs> mount stuff somewhat properly for testing now. It's, quite, it's our Discord server owner, Necro Dude. So thanks to him, we can look a little bit more professional, even if we use amateurs. And secure this. I'm just gonna use the corner screws because this is just it doesn't fall off. And I can mount graphics cards and stuff. The plan is to use a GeForce 3 card here for testing. The one we're gonna use later. Already I have a disk test disk Windows 2000 that works. So assuming this thing still posts and everything, I do have to set everything in the BIOS. So now we're gonna use uh, GeForce 3 TI 200. It should be a GeForce 3 if it's gonna be paired correct, but uh, well, at least the TI 200 isn't isn't any faster. It's slower. But it's also new, but it's, it's fine. They usually look the same, essentially. This is a really crappy TI-200, so it doesn't clock anything. I converted this to a Mac, but found out that it was unstable in Halo at higher settings. So converted it back and used my better TI-200 for a Mac instead. So, yep. So this is an 80 plus gold power supply, it's pretty old and early FSP one. So we have 24 amps on the 5 volt drain, and that seems to be more than enough. This thing pulls about 90 watts with graphics card and a 10,000 RPM hard drive and stuff like that. So we're ready to go here, so power on. Let's put it on the right output or input. Yeah. So let's see. Let's do a reset. It's, it doesn't like if you abort uh, the memory count before setting the bytes and everything. That was the problem I had when the memory slots were dirty. You can abort it later, but initially. So I'm just gonna let it post now and count. So we got two 500s, but that's because the bus is set to 66, I think, by default. So it should count about two and a half now, it seems. It does that until you set the CPUs, it seems. So two and a half gigs of RAM. Then we can set the CPUs. That's odd. It's still going. Okay, maybe it doesn't do that anymore. Well, I did 314. Three, okay. But it might also be because I cleaned the slots last time. Before I did that, I got two and a half. Yep, yeah, so it's, it's a, bit, a little bit slow. I got one gigahertz CPUs. So now we need to set everything. Uh, so I set the time and date and stuff. Um, we've got three gigs of RAM detected right now. I think that's uh, somewhat normal. I don't think there's anything wrong because it did similar things before until you save. Select the one gigahertz CPU. Uh, let's see here what is left to do. So the fans are running 2400 RPM, 2500. Much quieter than the uh, horrible deltas. Don't know why I can't find ECC. I think it might require a restart to actually do that. Now let's do that. Let's see what it says about the RAM. And well, since the past three gigs, I think, yeah, three thousand. Like I said earlier in the video, I think you cannot get all of it because the PCI and ADP and other stuff will use RAM. So right now we've got three thousand eight hundred fifty-six out of like four thousand ninety-six. So we're using a little bit over a hundred. That like the graphics card has sixty-four megabytes on board. That's gonna overlap, and then the I think the app. I don't know if the AGP app precisely does, but if you use an a PCI card with almost no memory, you save a lot. Uh, so see if I can actually find ECC on this 
board now. It's kind of weird finding it. I don't know why it's so hard to find it. Yeah, so that it seems like you have to do a restart to actually enable uh, the option for ECC. So you can select it now because we have that. It took me a while to figure out. I was, I was wondering what the options were initially on this board. And now it says we're having two, three, three, six timings, but EPU C claims three, 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 which is what the memory should be with that uh, stepping we had uh, on that RAM. Uh, so yeah, it's a little bit weird. The board reports lower than it actually is. So you can actually mount a hard drive to this and a capture card. So why don't we do that, I think. We're in Windows here. It took some time to get in. Uh, this is a lab drive, so pretty slow and sluggish. Uh, but I'm gonna make a clean install once we get an OS up running. But we have two CPUs here, plenty of RAM. So uh, let's run. Let's see here if we'll take uh, programs here. CPU C. Take that one. Let's see what we have. So Pentium 3 EB, one gigahertz, and we have two processors. Cache main board. So you can see we got the right uh, main board. Memory, 3,856 megabytes, and the timings are correctly displayed here, unlike the BIOS, which is weird, and SPD doesn't work with that TI and then, yeah. Seven zip is installed. Oh, we can do a benchmark on that, I think. Oh, where is that program? Seven zip. Should have a like a tell us like SAP scaling, I think. Tools benchmark. Yep, let's do that. Compressing has to one percent usage, and right now at 200. I don't remember what I had my Atom MP other than other than the fact that I have like I think it was like almost 100 percent scaling to. Total rating 185 percent. Yeah, but that's pretty cool. Don't know how this compared to my Atom Lampy, but that thing should be like twice as fast. So you can run some 3D Mark. Uh, I don't have much installed here. New custom. Don't need these, they are useless for the benchmark score. Only the top ones are good for that. Benchmark. Almost 6,000 points, so a little bit lower than I hoped for, but it's probably somewhat in line with the untweaked and tuned system around 1 GHz. Don't have any uses, second CPU, and uh, SP systems usually aren't the best for gaming or something gaming like, but it's still uh, more than adequate. We have successfully recapped the uh, Asus. CUV4X DLS motherboard with some new uh, Panasonic low SR caps, slightly lower than the original uh, Nishikon. We have got some really good Nishikons on it too. Uh, we got the Alpha PAL coolers on there with some uh, nice Sunong fans, so a lot quieter. I'm thinking I'm probably gonna sleeve these, and take the fans off again, and add a resistor to get them even lower because. When I run through the mark now, these things are ice cold, like they're really cold. And because these fans are thicker than other ones, they actually move more air for the same RPM. A lower RPM and move a little bit less air, I think, than other ones, but not that much because of the extra thickness. You get more fan 
blade area and better static pressure. And uh, the hub in the middle is a lot smaller. So that's also nice. So I think we can make the system even quieter if we want to. So I think that's it for this episode. Uh, I don't know if the next episode is going to be the final build. That somewhat depends on uh, what needs to be done with the things I have that's going to go into the build. But there's definitely going to be at least another part, maybe two. So yeah, thank you for watching and have a nice day. If you want to follow us, you can go to our social media webpage braindrainland.tk and pick your favorite platform. Link is in the description. You can join us on our Discord server. We host public lands when possible and game nights on our server hosting many old classical multiplayer games like Quake, Counter Strike and much more. Or you can show off your own retro LAN or maybe visit our members private LAN parties. We have a galleries, benchmark channels where you can post images, videos of your retro hardware and your scores and much more. So come and join us and share your retro experience with us. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.